The following program is suitable for all ages. The phone. A certain magic will always linger with the very name. It speaks of courage and fervor and the world's most brutal game. 55. Worn by Doug Buffone, a Chicago Bear through and through. He demanded excellence of himself and anyone wearing navy blue. You tell me what's going on. This is moronic. We're going to get our whipped all the way down the line. I want somebody to get kicked in and get out there and play. You're getting paid to play this game. And play it right. I don't mind you getting beat. I got my whipped many times. But I tell you, I took somebody down with me. You are a professional team. Act like one for God's sakes. Football fans, this is Buffon 55. The John Buffon Show. Hello and welcome to another edition of Buffon 55, a fast-paced approach to Chicago Bears football analysis. I am your host, John Buffone, and we got a, I guess you can say it's a good one today, the Browns coming into Chicago to take on the Bears on Christmas Eve. It's the matchup we've all been waiting for. Will the Bears be the lone win for the Browns this year? Can they hold off those pesky Browns from Cleveland? Uh, we're going to get into that a little bit later, but before we start, I want to throw it over to my trusty producer, Aldo Gandia, to tell you how the show works, and if, you, if this is your first time listening, you're going to enjoy it all. Tell them how the show works. It works pretty simply. I will ask you five questions about the Chicago Bears, five questions about the winless Cleveland Browns, and you have 55 seconds to respond to each question. You'll hear a whistle as your signal to wrap up. The fives, of course, are a tribute to number 55, Doug Buffon, your uncle, my childhood hero. And John, let me also welcome the folks who are congregating over at the barroom chat room. I know your uh, sergeant at arms, Benjamin Driscoula, is already there. And uh, uh, Benjamin actually asked you a question that I was already planning on asking you, which is how do you spend the Christmas holiday, John? Well, there is a lot of eating involved in case you, if, if anyone's been following me on Twitter, they know how much I enjoy eating and the Buffon family in general is full of people who enjoy eating. But I am going back to Pittsburgh. I'm driving back tomorrow. Big family party on Saturday and then another family party on Sunday, which involves the same people. And then, we, you know, you go to church and then you have uh, on Christmas Eve, we're doing the meal of the seven fishes. Any of my Italian friends out there know what I'm talking about. A big seafood feast on Christmas Eve is a big deal for some Italians. And then on Christmas morning, you kind of just relax you do the presents thing and of course you eat more so it's, it's kind of a it's kind of an entire cheat weekend so uh I, I usually try to watch what i'm eating but when it comes to the holidays and i'm going home it's no holes barred nothing is off limits it's just uh it's kind of a gorge fest in the buffoon household and then back on the beat uh, doing your news sports job yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> after that, I mean, I, I luckily have Christmas off, and then I got a quick turnaround, and I got to get back, uh, back out here to get on the news the next day. So it, it's, it's. Um, I'm gonna try to disconnect for a little bit, but, uh, it, it, but I also gotta keep it in the back of my head that I got to report back for duty on Tuesday. Okay. Well, uh, hopefully, you have time to see the Browns <laughs> Bears game so we can talk <laughs> oh, about yeah. it next week. All right, let's get underway. First of all, we have five questions about the Bears and five on the Browns, so this is our first half of the show. The first question, after breaking that five-game losing streak, the Bears go over to Ford Field and they lose to the Detroit Lions team that was, of course, fighting for a playoff life while the Bears were not. Uh, what's your overall assessment of the Bears' performance in that game? And, John, you are on the clock. My assessment was uh, they did exactly what I thought they were going to do. They were going to let us down after showing a flicker of hope the week before. That's kind of what they do. That freaking game was over in the first quarter. I don't care if it was only three to nothing. I saw no life. I saw no spirit. And it looks like they could not wait to get out of Ford Field and, quite frankly, get out of Detroit. I mean, Mitch had a bad game and they had no running game and they got gashed for big yards on defense they gave up nearly 100 yards on the ground to a running back tandem that isn't very good and they also turned the ball over on offense and quite frankly they just looked really bad but mitch did throw the ball nearly 50 times so the yardage was good so but they they, they, they couldn't score they couldn't score they couldn't put any points on the board so my assessment they stunk they checked out they're done and 2017 cannot end soon enough 
for the Chicago Bears. This is the epitome of the John Fox era. Absolutely no consistency. So maybe the lesson is don't ever get your hope up, even if it's the smallest amount of optimism. Don't ever get your hopes up because Fox and Loggins and the whole gang will make sure that the optimism is thoroughly crushed. That would be my assessment of last week's ball game. But how do you really feel, John? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I like to speak in a lot of subtleties sometimes, so it's hard to really dig through my message behind the message. <laughs> Benjamin wants to know if you can take over for uh, Larry Mayer and his lunch with Larry over at ChicagoBears.com. You'd uh, get to the truth a lot quicker than uh, than our friend Larry does. Tell him to give me a call. All righty. Uh, John, as you know, that uh, at this time of the season with this Bears record, uh, that the most important thing probably at this point is uh, player development. Now, you saw uh, Mitch Trubisky throw those three interceptions but did you see any progression that uh, uh that this young quarterback can build on uh moving forward you are on the clock now look i i know i see i know i said he had a bad game and he did but that's okay that's fine i'd rather see him sling it around right now what is there what is there to lose right now let him find his stride a little bit at least his arm got some work he's gonna have a ton of film to look over now to see what he did right and what he did wrong so i guess you could say the big progression so far is he's on the field he's not getting hurt quarterbacks in case nobody's noticed them are dropping like flies in the nfl there's no carson wentz there's no aaron Rodgers, no tom savage what's that work what's that worth no Desha- Sean Watson. There's no Sam Bradford. The fact that Trubisky is still standing and can go out there and play is helping his progression to an extent. I don't think Deshaun Watson is going to get any better by healing his torn ACL. Certainly, he's not getting any reps for it. So, obviously, the Bears coaching staff is no help at all to Trubisky. They are hindering his process. But if Mitch can make it through the year, he will be stronger for it because, hopefully, he won't have to deal with this kind of incompetence anymore when a new regime takes over. So, you look at Jared Goff. He's better for having to go gone through a hell year with Jeff Fisher. This negative can eventually be a positive, but that also depends on who the next coach is. Yeah, as I I was just about to say that the only thing that matters uh, for Mitch at this point is reps, and Benjamin Driscoola uh, beat, beat me to it in the chat room. Um, he is absolutely right. Give the guy reps. Let him uh, learn. Uh, and sometimes you can learn a lot by by being surrounded by things that aren't going right. You, you learn how to overcome adversity and so forth. And the one thing that has re- really impressed me about Trubisky is just how resolute he is uh, about his development and, and trying to, to stay positive during what is a very dismal rookie season for him and the team. All right, uh, we will now move to question number three. What are the players on this Bears team would you like to see progression from because you think that they can become integral members of the team in 2018 and beyond? John, you got 55 seconds. Go. Definitely Adam Shaheen. I I, I always give first-year tight ends some slack because it's a very different game, and you don't always see them break out as rookies. This year, you did see some flashes out of Evan Ingram in New York, but uh, O.J. Howard was another first-round pick, and he isn't setting the league on fire. Uh, Shaheen was a basketball player turned football player at a small college, so I don't know if and why people were expecting bigger numbers. I get the frustration of why he isn't on the field sometimes. That is infuriating, but once again, it comes down to the clouds sideline. So, in with another offseason and some work with he has the size and athleticism to take a big step forward. You'd also like to see guys like Leonard Floyd get healthy and continue his progression to being one of the best pass rushers in the league. You hope to God that Leonard Floyd doesn't start taking on the Brunel McPhee role of constantly being nicked up, and that keeps him from reaching his full potential. But uh, you look you look at a guy like Shaheen. He has all the potential in the world. Uh, a rookie season where it has some ups and downs. He needs to get on the field more, but I think that he's going to be a big-time target for Trubisky in the future. I really agree. I'm excited about Adam Shaheen, and um, I actually looked at the little bit of tape that was available of him prior to the draft because there was some buzz about him, this big guy that uh, played like Gronkowski down at Little Ashland University. I thought, wow, this guy would be a great fourth or fifth round steal. And then the Bears take him in the second in the round. Second round. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? But I think it, uh, it could very well uh, pay some big dividends down the road. All right. Uh, question number four. When we talk about player progression, how important is winning? 
What I mean is, if Trubisky throws three touchdown passes and zero interceptions, but the Bears lose to the Browns, does it really matter that they've lost another game in the Fox era? era? I'm really interested in your take on this question. And you are on the clock. Well, I kind of look at it in a different way. What good is a win if Trubisky only throws the ball nine or ten times? So what does a win over the Browns really mean? I get it. You don't want to be the team that loses to the Browns. But in the grand scheme of things, what does a win for you do right now if you hide all of your young talent and you don't get them out there to play? What good is it if Shaheen only plays eight or nine snaps? What good is it if Trubisky only throws the ball 10, 11 times for 100 yards? Are you really going to put the reins on Trubisky and not play Shaheen because you desperately need to go 5 and 11 compared to 4 and 12? So I think you have to play to progress. But this coaching staff is on its way out. So honestly, what do they care? So this is one of the reasons why I wanted them canned weeks ago to let somebody that has something to prove go in there and go a little bit crazy with the game plan. So uh, once again, what good does a win do if you just hide your quarterback? We know Jordan Howard's good, but what is 30 what is 30 carries uh, in this game going to do for him other than potentially shorten his career? So th- this is the Browns. This is the Cleveland Browns. Don't hide your players against the Cleveland Browns. John, do you think that um, John Fox should have gone to General Manager Ryan Pace and said, listen, you know, I I hope you're not going to judge me by my one loss record this year because I am going to try to develop these young guys and throw them in there. I know you've also provided me with some veterans, but I think it's much more important to get these guys uh, some snaps, a lot as many snaps as possible so that we can really be ready to take off in 2018. Do you think that maybe John Fox should have said that if he didn't? Uh, I think he should have done anything other than what he's doing now, which is like <laughs> trying to put all the all the veterans in there or just trying to be as safe as possible. And you, not only are you not progressing your young players, but you're also losing a hell of a lot of games. So uh, anything, anything would have been better than what he's doing now. And I think he, this is probably the worst case scenario that the Bears could have asked for their, out of their coaching staff this year. Yeah, you know, I, I, I kept thinking that the uh, when Ryan Pace came in as general manager, they should have s- announced that they were rebuilding right then and there, as opposed to pretending that they were uh, building uh, a uh, that they were going to contend. I think they wanted to contend as quickly as possible. John Fox came in with this reputation of turning around franchises right, right away, and that was the worst thing they could have done. They should have tried to unload Cutler and just start from scratch from the very beginning. Instead, what we have is a rebuilding program that is going to enter its fourth season. And it's into another sad. rebuilding program. Oh, my goodness. Oh, geez. All right. Now, this is uh, question number five. And at the end of the show, I will ask you for your prediction on the game against the Browns on Sunday. But right now, I am going to ask you for a prediction on when John Fox will be fired. John, you are on the clock. And by the way, so is John Fox. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, it should be when the clock strikes midnight on New Year's Eve. It should be before anybody pops the first cork off of a champagne bottle. The first words out of uh, the, the, some of the Bears, uh, Matt, out of Ryan Pace's mouth, should be John Fox. You're done. But I kind of see the Bears dragging their feet for a day on this. They don't. Maybe they don't fire Fox on New Year's Day because it's kind of a weird setup this year because the end of the season is kind of on New Year's Day. So I don't know if they're going to be really all business on New Year's Day. Who knows? It's the Bears. I mean, we've heard Rex Grossman say he wasn't tuned into a game once because it was New Year's even he was super excited about it so that would be par for the course so I, I, my guess it might be like january 2nd but you also know what i could see them waiting two or three extra days and putting bears fans through misery because there could be an inkling of doubt that fox wouldn't be gone so my intuition tells me january 2nd but it also depends uh how the rest of the dominoes fall in the nfl you'd think the bears would want all the time possible to peruse possible suitors but uh but but who knows if it were me he would have been gone after the green bay game but uh, the front office should be embarrassed right now so hopefully they are embarrassed enough to act quickly there could be as many as eight head coaching positions open at the end of the year and the bears are probably going to be one of them they need to be uh, they need to be looking right now they, they they need to be on this they need to be in this this whole mindset right now to find the new coach that's going to help them uh progress their young quarterback and get on the right track so it it needs to be as soon as possible yeah, I agree. Now, do you think if the Browns embarrass the Chicago Bears on Christmas Eve, do you think that uh, it's possible that Ryan Pace would hand them his walking papers immediately? 
you would hope, but at the same time, they lost to the Niners and then nothing <laughs> happened. I mean, they, they couldn't. There's there's plenty of games. They should after the Green Bay game where they had everything in their favor. They were at home. Green Bay was beat up. They were on the ropes. They didn't have Aaron Rodgers. They had every advantage in that game and they completely fell off the cliff. There there should have been plenty of instances where there Ryan Page should have said this is enough. So it looks as though they're just, they don't even care. They're going to wait until the end of the season to 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 make a decision. So yeah, if the Browns beat them, they should be gone. He should all of them should be gone, but they probably won't be. I agree with uh, Sergeant Benjamin in the chat room who says that the Bears should do like the Bengals uh, are doing, which is to tell Marvin Lewis he's being fired uh, and just finish out the, the season. Now, I had not heard uh, that news. I don't know if it's official, but that is that is what – if I was Ryan Pace, I would tell John, hey, we're letting you go at the end of the season, so you know you want to address the players you know, one final time before the Vikings game, uh, but right afterwards, uh, here's your plane ticket out of town. Well, yeah, Marvin Lewis's contract expired, and they didn't. They just decided not to renew it. And I okay. think that he was probably done in Cincinnati as well. He'd probably want to move on to somewhere else too. But at least Marvin Lewis gave you 15 years of somewhat competitive. I know they didn't win a playoff game, but at least they were in the mix for a lot of it. So this is a this, this is a different thing. I, Fox should have been should have been fired a long time ago. Address the team after you get fired. Say, right. hey, you're done. Go talk to the team. Tell them bye. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, uh, I, I like the fact that you stick with a coach for for a period of time. But he's got to give you some hope. And I think Marvin Lewis, at least the first seven, eight, ten years, he was providing that franchise with hope. And, and right. But they probably kept him on a few years too long. All right. Now we move to the second half and we ask some questions about the Cleveland Browns. So please, audience, stick with us. John's going to make this interesting. <laughs> All right. First question I have to ask this. Uh, is, is this team as pathetic as their winless record? John, you're on the clock. Actually, not really. I mean, I mean, obviously, 0-14 means you're a pretty bad team. But they've had four games where they lost by just three points. They should have beaten the Packers a few weeks ago, and they, they kind of screwed it up. You look at the roster on paper, and you kind of understand why some Browns fans would assume their team was at least going to get one win this year, at least a game. You bring in a rookie quarterback into Sean Kaiser, but you really don't have anyone to put in front of him. So he's been thrown to the dogs early. When I say put in front of him, I mean they didn't have any – real veteran presence to start over him. So he was just kind of tossed into the fire. And then you thought maybe Isaiah Crowell would turn into something, but he's been a letdown, just 788 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, you draft a highly athletic tight end like David Njoku, but he's having a slow rookie season like tight ends do, like I talked about before, just 29 receptions for 335 yards and four touchdowns. Well, on defense, you got the number one pick out there in Miles Garrett. He's been banged up a little bit, but you also take Jabril, Jabril Preppers and you traded for um, you know Jamie Collins at linebacker last year. Danny Shelton is a solid defensive lineman. So are they as bad as their record? It's hard for me to say yes, but that's their record. They're 0-14, so maybe they are. I would be moderately excited if uh, with the roster moving forward if I were a Browns fan, but that's I know that's not easy for Browns fans to do, be excited about the future because they've been trying to be excited about the future for, I think, in 30 years. Well, that's a good analysis. I I, I, I'm, I agree with you. And, and regarding that tight end situation, I, I agree with you. Now, this guy, um, Najoko is, is how you pronounce Injoku. it? Njoko. Njoko. He, uh, he was a pass-catching tight end, correct? At, yes. At Miami? Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, it's these guys have so much to learn what, playing tight end at, at the NFL position. And so you almost think that you, you should just kind of let them focus on one part of the game because learning the tackling and multiple formations and the, the route tree and so forth, that's quite Not a easy. bit. Not easy. Yeah, it's quite a bit. All right, now question number two. Are the Bears the Cleveland Browns of the NFC? John, you're on the clock. Oh God! I hate that I have to answer this. Uh, not not quite yet. They 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 share some similarities as far as quarterback carousels, but Cleveland has reached the playoffs only twice since the end of the 1980s. That's 1994 and 2002. Uh, but you look at the Bears since firing Lovey Smith, they've had the second worst record among NFC teams at 26 and 52. Only the Buccaneers have had a worst record at 25 and 53 over that same span. So it it kind of sucks that I have to defend the Bears on this. Like I have to come up with a defense on why the Bears aren't the Browns. You know how demoralizing that is? But the Browns are going through some front office turmoil. They don't really know what's going on with the coaching staff, and they perennially screw up the draft. I know I could have substituted Browns with Bears there, and it would have sounded very similar, but stick with me. The Bears <laughs> had the guts to go out and draft their quarterback, and they hit on a few guys in the draft. If Trubisky busts out, then the Bears take another step towards Browns' status. But they aren't 
quite there yet. They, 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 they have a chance to kind of turn this boat around, and they have to do it quick, or they're going to end up uh, driving that boat all the way over to uh, Cleveland. They're going to be on Lake Erie before, before too long. So, um, yeah, they're not quite the Browns, but, man, they're, uh, they're taking steps there, but they've they, they got to turn it around quick. They sure do, and uh, <laughs> if they don't, then it could be worse than the Browns. Yeah. All right. Now, Deshaun Kaiser, he's had the rookie quarterback has had a tough uh, campaign, his initial campaign. Can you tell listeners what you think of his play? And do you think that maybe he was rushed into duty too quickly or perhaps he's benefiting from all the snaps that he's been getting? John, you're on the clock. Uh, I think he was definitely thrown in too quickly because once you put the rookie in, you can't take him out unless you're the Browns and then you decide that you're going to announce a new starter every week. So uh, it's not a great year, only about 2,400 yards passing, nine touchdowns and 19 interceptions. He, he has made some really, really bad decisions when it comes to interceptions. The, the pick against the Packers, he basically closed his eyes, chucked it straight up in the air off his back foot, and it basically looked like a punt. So he needs some coaching and he was nowhere near ready to get put in. And when he was put in, it didn't appear that Hugh Jackson formatted the offense for him. I, I, I never really liked when coaches basically say the offense is the offense and you better learn it because it's a great offense and you need to learn how to do it. Each player has their own strengths and weaknesses and the best coaches are able to tailor fit their system to the players, especially when they're rookies and they're not really in any kind of a rhythm. So uh, I don't think Kaiser could handle this offense this year, and uh, it looks like these ultra-smart offensive coaches that the Browns have around him didn't do him any favors. So, yeah, it, tough break for Deshaun Kaiser because it's very possible that this was his only shot as a starter, at least in Cleveland, which is really sad because he, he it wasn't really fair. Yeah, and you know, Hugh Jackson has this reputation as a quarterback whisperer, and I, I don't see it. I don't. I haven't studied his career, but... Boy, I don't, I don't see, I don't recall there being any great success that Jackson has had with quarterbacks. I don't know if, I don't know if he's so much developing the quarterbacks as much as is he has a good offensive system and he needs a good quarterback to run it. I maybe, see. maybe he's not as good as bringing the guys up and coaching them up, but once they, once they are talented, he has a system that can, that can be successful. I don't know. I, I haven't seen him develop uh, Kaiser at all this year, so we'll see. Yeah, uh, Isaiah Robles in the chat room reminds us that Mark Tressman was a quarterback. Whisperer. So. Mark Tressman was a lot of things. Yeah. Um, he was a horse, a horse whisperer. Is that what That's <laughs> someone what said in the chat room? A horse whisperer. He was a horse something. I don't know about a war, uh, whisperer, though. Thank you for keeping it clean, John. Yeah. Uh, question number four The Browns team could become an instant contender given the youth on their roster and all the draft picks they have. Who are some of these young players that you like on that roster? I know you mentioned some at the top of the show. And could uh, they potentially add some – who could they could potentially add in this upcoming draft? And do you agree with me that they could become an instant contender if things, certain things go their way? Give us an assessment. John, you're on the clock. Surprisingly, yes. Uh, there are some guys I mentioned before. They should love Miles Garrett. Big time athleticism. If he stays healthy, he should be a force for years. Same with Njoku at the tight end position. He's 6'4", uh, 250 pounds, runs a 4'6", I think he'll be a great weapon for whoever's playing quarterback next year for the Browns. And I know he's not exactly new, but how about Josh Gordon? Kind of looking like the Josh Gordon we saw a few years ago, and he's been out of football for like two years. He's only 26, which is weird to think about. And that's like going out and getting a big time free agent without the big time spending part. So you look at their draft picks. They have two in the first round and three in the second in this upcoming draft. They are loaded up. And although it would suck to kind of cut the Deshaun Kaiser project short, they've wasted a second round on Kaiser, a third rounder on Cody Kessler. Uh, but after the a season of after this season, you have to think that the Browns are going to take a quarterback in the first round. They almost have to, or their fans are maybe going to burn that stadium to the ground. And maybe if they draft a quarterback early, they also grab a running back like Saquon Barkley with the other first round pick. So maybe they get their Dak Prescott, uh, Zeke Elliott combination in the same draft, a stud running back to help out the rookie quarterback and a security blanket tight end, an explosive wide receiver. 2018 could be much different for the Browns if things kind of work out. Yeah, you're right about – so they've, it, they're going to take a quarterback in the first round this year. That's almost a guarantee. They took one in the second round last year, and then they picked Kessler the year before that in the third round. So they've picked a quarterback uh, in the last three years, rounds one, two, three. That's, that's – uh, 
I don't think any team has ever done that. That's pretty incredible. Keep swinging until you hit one. There one. you go. All right. So our final question uh, before we get your prediction, and I love this question. I wish I would have thought of this question uh, at the beginning of the season. This final question, I, I, I'm now asking you your position-by-position position breakdowns of the Bears <laughs> and their opponent. It's just fun to hear you sc- cram five minutes worth of material into 55 seconds, uh, <laughs> and you've been doing a great job of it. It's like uh, winning a, a broadcaster's gold medal. So are you ready? I will do a countdown for you. Remember, you got 55 seconds. Three, two, one, go, John. All right, quarterback. First time I'm actually giving the edge to the Bears. The choice between Trubisky and Kaiser. Give me Mitch. Better control the offense and probably won't make any overly stupid interceptions. Running back Jordan Howard and Tariq Cohen over anything that the Browns trot out there. The Browns actually have a super watered down version of what the Bear, Bears have with Isaiah Crowell and Duke Johnson. Advantage, Bears. Uh, wide receiver. The closest it's been since I started doing this. Uh, Josh Gordon and Corey Coleman versus Dontrell Inman and Kendall Wright. Ooh, gross. But the edge, the Browns, because out of those four, there's only one that I really, really, really like on my team. That's Josh Gordon. I give this slight edge to the Browns wide receivers. Defense, the Bears are beaten up royally. The Browns haven't been much better either. I don't like anyone, but I'm going to give the edge to the Bears because they can maybe create a turnover or two. Special teams, Browns. I don't even care who they are. They have Zane Gonzalez kicking the ball. That's better than anything that the Bears are going to have. I'm never going to pick the Bears on special teams. Give me, like I said, give me Zane Gonzalez kicking it. Jabril Peppers returning it. That so far that 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 is uh, two for two with a push. So I kind of give a push on the defenses a little bit. So uh, what do you know? The Bears and Browns are even when it comes to me doing down these position <laughs> breakdowns. Great job, great job. I asked the chat room uh, how you were doing. Should I give you a gold, silver, or bronze? And uh, Drisgula says. You deserve all three medals. <laughs> That's the president of my fan club right there. <laughs> He's a good man, Benjamin Jusgula. All right. Uh, it is time for prediction time, and then take us to the close, John. And I want to, before uh, you sign off, I want to wish you a happy holiday and thank you very much for uh, this great season of broadcasting the Buffon 55 John Buffon show. It's been fun working with you. Happy holidays. Let's hear your prediction. Oh, same to you at Aldo, and same to all the barflies as well. Uh, going into the show, I was convinced the Bears would win by 10, and somehow I started convincing myself otherwise. I don't like that. Uh, this is the last home game. The Browns probably aren't stoked that they have to go to Chicago on Christmas Eve. The Bears are going to run the ball effectively in this game. Trubisky probably won't throw the ball as much as he did last week. He'll probably have the reins put on him a little bit, which I don't like. Uh, but I don't see the Browns really moving the ball either. This has the potential to induce mass naps among viewers. This is going to be Christmas Eve. I don't know how tuned in people might actually be to this, but I think the Bears defense will make a play, and maybe we see a little Tariq Cohen magic that's going to make the difference. I say the Bears win their final home game of the season in a blistering shootout, 17-9. to nine. Yeah, I, That's what I'm predicting this game's going to be. It's going to be a nice snooze fest for the most part but you know John Fox is favored in this game so he doesn't exactly have the best record in that aspect so anything can happen the Browns are they don't want to go 0-16 the Bears better be uh, on their guard whenever they're trying to defend their home turf but I will say the Bears come out of this one with a 17-19 to victory and before we go I just want to say that we will be back next week returning for our season finale but it's going to be on Friday December 29th that's when we're going to do our season finale in the meantime make sure you stop by at bearsbarroom.com for features like Brett Maley's most frustrating moments in Bears history and the latest on the John Fox coaching status. And don't forget that this show, along with other three others, are available on the Bears Barroom Radio Network. You can subscribe on iTunes or podbean.com. And a new programming note on Christmas Day, join us here at mixlr.com for a two- our Bears Barroom special. You'll be able to hear all of the Bears parody songs, hear Draft Dr. Phil talk about them, and the Bears team there will be, there will also be some surprises as well. That show will be available on your podcast stream the following day. Again, I will be back December 29th. That's a Friday. Until then, happy holidays and bear down.